not me react to him. Because I, if I'm reacting to him, I'm dying. If he's reacting to me, then he's going to die. Because I can tell you what, right now, and police officers and military guys know this, a lot of times the general public doesn't know this because they, they get a lot of this stuff from TV. If I'm a police officer and there's a bad guy standing in front of me and I have my, my pistol at a low ready position and I'm in the middle of an interview like, what, what is going on here, et cetera, et cetera. Even if I see a gun sitting right here, from a low ready position, if it was, if the bad guy was had the intent to do this, and I've got my gun ready to shoot, I'm ready. He can pull the gun out of his pants, present the weapon, shoot me, before I can move that gun from here to here. Why is that? Is he that fast? It's because I'm reacting to him. I can never outstart him. If he starts first, you can't outpunch the guy who throws the jab first unless it's a slow jab, okay? Counterpunching is not hitting you before you hit me if we throw at the same time. Counterpunching, in terms of boxing, is when you throw the jab, I'm countering back with something, okay? A lot of people don't get some of these concepts, all right? So the key to surviving in, a, in an attack situation like that is to turn the tables as fast as you can. And as the Marine Corps has taught for the last couple hundred years, the best way to defeat the enemy when he's shooting first, in a, in a, especially in, a, in a, something we can all relate to, an ambush situation, is to return overwhelming firepower. So again, you get him to react to you and not you to him. Now, in terms of boxing, because it's really easy to illustrate, because a lot of people have seen boxing and all that at some point in their life. Um, you will see in a boxing match, when one guy opens up with a quote unquote flurry, the other guy goes into a cover position. He's defending himself. Well, there's a couple reasons for that. It's a sport, so he can cover himself and he knows that the guy's not going to kill him. Okay? He might not want to get knocked out, he might not want to get hurt or whatever, but at the same time he knows there's a referee and there's people there and police and medics and everything else. So you can get away with that. But the point is, that flurry, even if every one of those punches isn't connecting directly to his chin to knock him out, it's still causing a reaction in him. So again, I'm not talking about technique, I'm not talking about perfect punching and all the kind of stuff that guys teach in the martial arts stuff. Just the fact that he comes up to grab me and I just start wailing on him as fast as I can, imperfect punches though they may be, it's going to cause a reaction in him. And I'll talk about some of the instinctual triggers that I can cause to have happen in him. Now, back to what I was talking about, what happens when you are faced with an imminent threat and the amygdala is triggered and all of those things physiologically start to happen in your body. Everybody knows about the chemical cocktails of adrenaline and hydrocortisol and all of those good things that are dumped into your body. Is that correct? Everybody knows that when that happens, your hands turn into clubs, you lose, you know, you can't work your computer, you can't do high math skills, you lose these finite motor skills. Everybody knows that. We've all heard that. Combat environment, adrenaline rush, you lose that ability to do those real complex things. Tell that to a fighter pilot. Is there anything on earth that requires more complex finite motor skills than being a combat fighter pilot? What about when he's in combat and he's tracking multiple targets and he's controlling a $35 million plane going Mach 2 and he's being locked on by enemy missiles He's on a mission, he's got to keep those parameters in touch, he's got to keep aware of, of his teammates and the other guys in the air. That's pretty goddamn, that, that's pretty darn, <laughs> that's pretty darn complex motor skills, right? But he's got probably one of the biggest adrenaline rushes going on that a human being could experience, okay? And if you want to, if you want to read further into this, NASA is the greatest repository for these types of studies that exist in the world. And you can go and, and go online and you can go and get books and, and studies done by NASA because again, guys out 22,000 miles out in space or 249,000 miles out in space going to the moon, they're on their own. And there can be some pretty god dang hairy situations that manifest when you're out in outer space and those guys have got to keep their wits about them. So again, 
What am I talking about? Well, one of the things that the reason that the sociopath succeeds in being able to do all of these things to, to people like us is because he's done it before. Remember when I talked about that? It's not the first time he's ever done it. Okay, what about what we do? What's our training? Okay, you go to the uh, range and you shoot targets. Boom, boom, boom. You shoot in low light. You shoot at a moving target. You shoot while you're moving. You practice malfunctions, clearing your weapon, all of those kind of things, all right? That's because you want to you want to have that happen to you so that you're used to it. One of the things that I talk about 100% of the time when we talk about real-time survival in combat environment is you never want something to happen to you for the first time in a combat environment, okay? Never, ever, ever. Your training should support as much of the contingencies that are gonna present in that environment as humanly possible, okay? It is the same in shooting as it is in fighting, as it is in race car driving, as it is in driving a tank, as it is in flying a jet fighter plane, okay? Now, who knows about Colonel John Boyd? Colonel Boyd, okay. Oodaloo, all right, well, 30-second Boyd was what they used to call him because he would go into combat and in 30 seconds he would take the enemy out of combat. And he was a, a government advisor, he was, a, he was an ace or whatever, maybe not an ace, I'm, I'm not sure, but anyway, he was a, a well-renowned, brilliant uh, fighter pilot who was way more than just a fighter pilot, but was actually a, a huge, huge high-thinking man. And they, they looked at something way back, right after World War II, and they said, well, okay, when is, the, when is the most likely time for a fighter pilot to be shot down? Very first mission. That's when most guys get shot down. First time they hop in that plane, go off on a combat sortie, okay? So they also looked at it and said, well, why do some guys survive combat? They just seem to weather the storm. What they looked at was they looked at all the empirical data and they said, look, after about eight to 10 missions, combat missions, you don't get shot down. If you can get through the first eight to 10, 12 missions, you're gonna survive the entire war. Why? Because you have been in the combat environment, performed the skills that are necessary in that combat environment, and you've done it again and again and again and again. So when the, sh you know what, hits the fan, it isn't the first time you've experienced it. And as a long-term result of what he came up with, the OODA loop and everything else, which we might talk about, but what they did was, that was the genesis for the evolution of Top Gun, Red Flag, laser uh, tag, Army laser tag, all of those kind of environments. Because again, what you're trying to do is create the combat environment as realistically as you can putting individuals into that, making them, them perform these high level, high motor complex skills in the combat environment so that in theoretically, you've got all your combat experience in you before you actually engage the enemy in real life, okay? It's the same as a football team. And I was big on football. I went to the University of Wisconsin on a football scholarship. I'm not a big guy, but I, I did play football. Um, practice, you learn the plays. You go through the plays. You learn how to do them with the rest of your teammates. Then you evolve to, the, to someone who is on the other side against you, making it more difficult for you to do those plays because you have to do them spontaneously and things dynamic changes and all this and that. Then you go to the scrimmage where you actually are actively trying to make things happen against guys who are actively trying to make it not happen, and then Friday night's the game, okay? That's the real big show, and that's when you actually go into combat. It's the same principle. You do these things preliminarily to, to create this environment before you actually have to face it in real life, okay? Now, how does all that stuff apply to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat? Well, you gotta fight to learn how to fight, okay? That's why wrestlers are such good fighters, because a wrestler, junior high, high school, college, he fight, he fought every time he went up and practiced against another wrestler. Wrestling is one of the few martial arts, if you will, that actually makes you do what, you're, what you have to do Friday night on the mat against the opponent, okay? You're, you're practicing for the top spot on that team. 